All right, so the webinar has been recorded. All right, so today this is our objectives. Uh, this is uh, what we want to achieve in the course of today's class. All right, next is Shapo C3, and then we're going to be looking at Jenkins CI CD. Okay, now I want to, I just want to give us a few, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of information regarding DevOps, right? Because uh, it's one of the jobs, so it's one of the rules that is in demand in today's market, right? Uh, a lot of companies are looking at, you know, DevOps, they are trying to see, oh, sorry, is my sound audible? Am I audible, please? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you can hear you. Yes, you are. Oh, yes. yes, you are audible. Yes. All right. All right. Yes. Somebody said there's no sound, so I just wanted to be sure the sound is clear. All right. Thank you very much. Right. So we have uh, different, uh, what do you call it? Now, the, a lot of companies, of course, are looking to you know, moving their workloads from on-premises, right? The traditional settings where you have server within the organization, you deploy your application on your servers and all of that. So organizations are looking to move, you know, all of their workloads into the cloud because, of course, the cloud will save them, you know, a lot of uh, money in terms of capital expenditure. So basically, they don't have to buy all their servers upfront, right? So they can go into the cloud environment, provision a little server, see if they, if whatever they want to deploy, if it's working, then they can scale. So basically, what the cloud offers is, you know, that economics of scale, right? You can start small and then you can scale gradually. So Basically, the cloud offers you the model that is called, you know, you move from capital expenditure to what you call an operational expenses, right? So you don't have to purchase anything up front. That's just the idea, you know, regarding the cloud environment. So now let's look at a few things about DevOps. You know, why should we learn it? Why should you start if you want to venture into DevOps? Uh, is this something you can just start, uh, you know, at any level and all of that, right? So those are the things that we want to consider, okay? Those are the things that we want to consider. All right, so let's look at the slides that we have here. All right, so DevOps, uh, if we look at the cycle that we have, uh, if we look at the cycle that we have, DevOps basically it's uh, you know an iterative process, right? You have uh, what you call, you know, as you're building the application, you plan, you code, you test, and then it goes back, you know, on and on like that. So it's not it's just you know it's just a move away from the waterfall model where you have to start everything you know in a sequential order. So you do this, you do this, and then after everything is done, you go back. So with DevOps, you have what you call uh, you know, you define your requirements, you design the user interface, the development of the application, uh, there's quality assurance, which is your Q&A, and then there's the UAT, which is the user acceptance testing, and then there's the client feedback, which basically it's, uh, you know, the client, have, they've used the application, and then maybe they are satisfied or not with it, right? You get feedback uh, from them. Now, an example of that kind of feedback mechanism, it's of course, most of us have mobile phones, right? Uh, so on your mobile phone, you have, if you're using Apple, there's the Apple store, if you're using, uh, if you're using, what do you call it now? If you're using um, an Android phone, you have the Google Play Store. Now for every application that you have on all of those uh, Play Stores, there's what you call the, uh, you know, reviews, right? If you look at all these applications, there's a review section where customers will go in and, you know, comment on the usability of that application, right? So users would comment if, they, you know, if there's any function that the users, uh, if there's any function that they have used and then it's not functioning very well, the users have the right to, you know, put a comment in the review section. So for Google Play, for... Apple Store and all these other applications, there's the comment section, there's the review. And that's why for all of those applications, you see that some of them, they are four stars. Some of them, they have you know five stars and some of them, they'll tell you the number of the reviews that they have had. So basically DevOps is just that, you know, you take all of those comments about what people are saying about your application. 
you take that you know, back to your own team and that is the client feedback, right? So if whatever it is that the client are saying, if whatever they are saying does not seem to go on well, uh, you know, with your application does not meet your own objectives, then of course you incorporate that customer reviews, right? That's the CRs that you have right here. So you incorporate that customer reviews back into your requirement. So you take it back and then you review the application. And that is why, you know, most times you can update an application on Monday and then on Friday, there's another update for you again, right? So you go to your Play Store or maybe you open the application and then they tell you, oh, before you can go ahead, you have to update this application. So you update. And then after like two weeks again, the same application is asking you to update. So basically what DevOps is, is just people are not waiting, right, to ensure that the whole application is perfect, right? They design an application, they put it out there, right, for customers to download, for customers to use. Now, the people who have downloaded it, they get back to the organizations being, you know, using the review section of, the, you know, all these play stores. They take back those feedbacks, right? They take them in and then they go back to their own team. They work on it again and they release updates, right? And that's why for every application you have on your phone, every application you have on your system, there are updates regularly, right? There are updates regularly. And that's just basically what DevOps it's about. Right, that's basically what DevOps it's about. Because how can we, you know, take all of these comments? How can we take all of these reviews and you know take them back and make sure that we are satisfying our customers regularly, right? Regularly, and that's why customer reviews, you know, are very important because that is what really drives uh, the DevOps process. Now, having said all of this, let's look at a few things. Now. If you look at what we have here, these are basically DevOps tools, right? So which means as a DevOps engineer, you need to know quite a number of tools. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, do you really need to understand all of these tools? Do you really need to know, right, all of these tools? Okay, now that is one question that you may want to ask uh, yourself. Like, okay, as a DevOps engineer, you know, do you have a more approach uh, for learning all these things? Now, let's look at the bottom-up approach. Now, the first thing as a DevOps person that you want to learn is Linux. Now, it's at the bottom because every of those tools, right, that you want to learn, they are actually built on the Linux operating system. That's just the truth. Now, why do I say that? Now, don't forget. Now, let's go back to the previous slide. Now. Let's go back to this slide. Now, every tool that you have here, now look at all these things that you have right here. If you look at all these things, now there's one thing that is common to them, all right? There's one thing that is common to all of these things that you have here, except for, you know, just one thing, right? Except for, except for one of them. Now, the only thing that is common to all of these tools is that they are all open source, right? They are all, open source, Jenkins is open source, Python is open source, uh, your GitLab, Git is open source, Linux is open source, obviously, uh, you know, GitHub and all these things, all these tools are open source. Now, minus the cloud providers, right? The Azure, the GCP, AWS, those ones are cloud providers, right? And of course, they also support open source applications, right? But if you look at all the tools in general, Ansible, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, all of these applications, they are all open source and Linux is also open source. So which means open source basically means anybody can take an open source tool and modify it to suit what they want. want. And that's why if you look at it critically, there are several variants of the Linux operating system, right? So for the Linux operating system, you have Ubuntu, you have the Red Hat operating system, you have Fedora, you have CentOS, you have SUS, you know, you have a lot of Linux operating system, and that is because the Linux kernel is open source, right? So which means somebody can take the kernel, they can decide to build, you know, a Linux OS of their own choice that will serve their own purpose, right? And that is why for AWS as well, you have what you call the Amazon Linux 2 AMI, and, and, uh, and more recently, they also have the Amazon Linux 2023 um, AMI, right? So all of these tools are open source, and so if you really want to learn DevOps in the right order, because I see a lot of people 
uh, you know, some of them, they want to start just learning Kubernetes because, oh, they feel Kubernetes is popular. Everybody's talking about Kubernetes. I need to learn Kubernetes right now and all of that. That, that, that may be good. But then if you don't have a solid base, right, if your foundation is not solid enough, now you're going to get lost in the crowd. That's just the truth, right? If you don't have a very solid base, because the Kubernetes you want to learn, it's an application that is built on top of Linux as well. So which means if you want to be a very good, right, Kubernetes administrator, then you have to be someone who understands how the Linux you know, operating system operates, right? So Linux is the first thing that anybody that wants to learn, you know, DevOps, you know, that's the first thing you want to learn, right? It's at the base of everything, right? Like 27% of, you know, the website that we have in the world today, they all run on Linux. So why do you want, why do we want to push that, you know, aside and just go and learn Kubernetes? And then I see people too, you know, some people will tell you, oh, I want to learn Terraform infrastructure as code, you know, Terraform is all people are looking for Terraform and all that. No, Terraform is also good. But what I tell people is, if you want to learn any infrastructure as code too, then it must be that you are already a professional when it comes to, for example, if you want to learn Terraform, for example, before you can use Terraform, you must have been somebody who has interacted with any cloud provider before like Google Cloud, Azure, or AWS. Now, if you cannot navigate the console of those cloud providers successfully, then infrastructure as code is just going to be a myth. It's going to be a mystery, right? Because the infrastructure as code that you're using, right? All of those things that you type in, you know, all these variables that you define, they are actually variables that, of course, they are available already on the console. So I tell people, now don't jump the gun. Try as much as possible to have to build, you know, from the bottom up, right? So that by the time you eventually get into the job market, or even if you decide you want to just freelance and be on your own, all right, your understanding is solid because the foundation that you have is something that is really well built, all right? So that's what I tell, uh, that's what I tell people that, you know, don't just jump and say you want to go and learn all of these things, you know, start from a very solid base. So the first thing you want to learn is that you want to learn Linux. Now, after you are confident with Linux and then you are okay with Linux, uh, you're good with Linux and every other thing like that, then you want to move up, right? You want to learn Git, right? Now, whether it is GitLab, GitHub, or Bitbucket, or AWS code commits, now one thing that is common to all of these things that I've just mentioned is that they all, you know, use the Git command line, right? So Git push, uh, Git push, Git add, Git commit, Git rebase, all of these things, right? Git branch and all of that, there is the same command for GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, and AWS code commit, because all these things are built on the Git, right? Uh, on the Git uh, platform itself, okay? So once you are solid enough with Linux, then you want to move up right and then you want to learn git okay you want to be able to you know source, uh, source code management you must have heard of scm basically what the git lab does for your git or does for you is just a place where you can put your codes or your application codes and all of that and then you can keep it there you can share with your team you know it helps you to it helps with collaboration and things um, like that so git is the next thing that you want to learn and then so once you are okay with that once you can do your code commit once you can, you know, do all of these things, right? Then you can move on to the next one. Now, the next one you want to learn, of course, is Docker. Now, the reason you want to learn Docker Nest is because Docker is an application that you can install it on your Windows operating system, all right? With that one, you can have something like what you call the Docker desktop installed on your Windows operating system or on the Linux operating system or on a MacBook, uh, you can install the Docker CLI, right? So with Docker, you can actually practice on your system. We're going to see... Uh, a demonstration of that today. So you can practice Docker, you can install it, you can interact with it and learn, okay, how can I create a Docker file? How do I, you know, run a Docker image? How do I check the Docker log? If there's something wrong with my image, how do I check all of those things? Okay. Now, the next thing you want to learn after that is you want to learn a cloud. So you want to learn, you know, any cloud provider of your choice. So you can start with Azure, you can start with GCP, you can start with AWS, right? You can pick any of them. Right. But of course, in our own uh, demonstration today, we're going to be using AWS for our demonstration, right? So you can pick any of them and then you can learn any of those cloud providers. Now, the next thing you want to also learn after that is you want to learn, you know, uh, 
the CICD tool, code integration and code deployment. So there is Jenkins. And right now, most organizations are moving away right, from Jenkins and they are focusing on, you know, moving their applications to GitLab CICD. And then the next one you have here is what you call GitHub Actions. Now, in the course of the training that we are going to be providing, we're going to be, you know, uh, working people through Jenkins. And then as a bonus module, we're also going to be working people through what you call, uh, what you call GitLab CICD. Now, there's a concept in DevOps that is called shifting things to the left. Right, there's a concept in, in, in uh, DevOps that is called shifting things to the left. Now, shifting things to the left basically means that we're trying to make sure that our development environment will bring it closer, right, to maybe to our security system or to anything. Because with Jenkins, there's a lot of plugins that you have to install, right? But with GitLab CI CD, your source code is in the same place. You can create your secret in the same place. And then with your GitLab CI CD, you can do your deployment, maybe to Kubernetes, to Amazon EC2, and to other spaces. So there is really no many plugins that you have to install, right? So once you are done with all of that, the next thing you want to look at then, of course, you can go ahead and learn Kubernetes. Now you can see that, of course, you have started to build what you call you know, a solid foundation, right? So you want to learn Kubernetes. And then after you're done with Kubernetes, then you can learn this infrastructure as code too, right? You can learn all of these things, okay? So once you're done, so once you're able to build up your foundation like that, then if you want to learn Terraform, it is going to be easy because you already know how Azure works. You already know how GCP works. If you're using GCP, you already know how AWS also works, right? So learning infrastructure as code, learning cloud formation is going to be easy because you'll know your way around the console. So that's what I tell people. If you know your way around Azure console, around GCP console, around AWS console, you are not going to you are not going to swear to learning infrastructure as code. It's going to be easy for you, all right? Because if you want to create a subnet on the console, it's similar to if you want to do it on infrastructure as code, all right? It just, it just name changes and all of that. So once you're done with all of those things, if you're able to do the bottom-up approach, right, your foundation is solid and everything is, you know, solid, then if you can, if you send out your CVs and you apply for jobs, by the time you're going to do maybe two or three interviews, of course, you are definitely going to land, you know, your job role. And then for, you also want to learn Python. Python is basically, now you are learning Python, not because you want to write, you know, application codes, right? Python basically is to just write automation scripts because the goal of DevOps, right? The goal of DevOps is to automate every process of the software development lifecycle as much as possible, right? That is the goal of DevOps. That's what, you know, that's, that's just the basic goal of DevOps, all right? Making sure that we automate every process as much as we can, all right? That is why, you know, that's just basically what DevOps is about. All right, so that's just the bottom up approach. Now, if you have any questions, please, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions uh, before we go into the live demo that we want to do today. Any questions? If you want to ask, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, Mr. F. Young, I think there's a hand. Hello, hello. Hello, please go ahead and ask your question. Hey, I'm, I'm more, more familiar with SCCM than Azure. Um, the consoles are very similar. Um, will that be something that was more reliable? Uh, can you can you repeat a question, sir? I didn't quite get what you said. I'm sorry. Yes, I am more familiar with the Microsoft Endpoint Manager than Azure, but the two they're pretty easy to navigate. Both consoles, I feel like. Do you agree, or is uh this Azure is there much of a difference? All right, now Azure, right? Now Azure, GCP, and AWS, right? They are cloud providers, right? Public cloud providers, right? Now that is different from the Microsoft endpoint, if I get you correctly, that you mentioned. That's a bit different from the Microsoft endpoint that you said. So Azure, GCP, and AWS, these guys, what they do basically is that they provide you know, public cloud. Now, what is a public cloud? Now, public cloud is just basically a data center that somebody has decided to say, okay, you know what? Uh, instead of you buying the servers that you need in your own organization, I will make that investment. I will procure those servers for you. The only thing you need to do is to come on our own platform 
and then you pay as you use, right? That's just basically what the cloud providers are doing. So they are basically public, you know, cloud providers, right? So what they are doing basically is instead of you buying all of the servers that you need to run your workloads, right? You can come on our platform, provision the server you need, and then you pay per use, all right? So you're only going to pay for what you use, all right? And then they also have some services for you. And that's why, you, you know, I'm sure you've been hearing, okay, there's serverless, this serverless, that. There are other services, right? Apart from providing, you know, you access to servers, there are other services that they also provide you with that you can also leverage. Right. So basically what they are just trying to do is instead of you buying all of the things that you need upfront and then setting it up uh, in your own organization by your own self, and then that will take a longer time. It's, there's you know, there's going to be a lot of overhead for you as an organization, right? You have to deal with power, you have to deal with cooling, you have to deal with a lot of stuff. So instead of dealing with all of that stuff, you can migrate to a cloud provider, all right? And then they undo some part of the workloads for you. And then there are, there are some that you also manage uh, by your own self, right? So they are just public cloud providers. So it's this is is different from the enterprise endpoints uh, that you mentioned. Okay, sorry. Um, can I ask yeah. a question? Please okay, uh, why are you were mentioning um, the prerequisite for DevOps, I I didn't see why you mentioned um, networking fundamentals and um, that has uh, and web servers. I don't know if you skipped that um, knowingly or you just did that over All right, uh, thank you for that question. Now, uh, I didn't want to make the presentation too long, right? That's why I had to just compress it to the things that really matter. Now, if you're learning Linux, of course, you have to learn your networking fundamentals, right? You have to understand your OSI model very much, all right? The seven layers of the OSI model. Now, if you, if you look at what I have done, it just basically, what I did is just basically to mirror the OSI model. For those who are maybe into networking, they should, you know, I'm sure some of them will understand what the OSI model is. The OSI model is just basically a model that, you know, that your data communication follows, right? So now, if you're learning Linux, of course, you have to learn data communication. You have to learn the fundamentals of TCP IP communication, right? It's part of the things that you learn as part of your Linux um, learning. So it's it's not something well, of course, I didn't want to mention that because I'm conscious of time and I don't want to make the presentation too uh, lengthy so that uh, it won't be too boring uh, for people, right? But of course, it's uh, TCP IP, it's part of what you have to learn uh, in the course of uh, your journey, All right? Uh, thank you. Could you please tell me the tool names? Like the first one is Terraform. What is the second one? Because the, like you're showing only the logos. The logos, yes. Uh, the logo. Now the first one you have there is the Linux. That's the logo for Linux operating system. No, right? no, no. You're, you're coming from bottom, but I just I'm coming from top. Like first one is Terraform. The second one. I oh, think okay. it is the last yeah, two formation. Yeah, formation. The, yeah. The second one is cloud formation. Yes, that's cloud formation. The other one cloud is cloud formation. Ansible, then the last one is Python. The one in the middle here is Kubernetes. Uh, this is Jenkins. This is GitLab CI CD. And then this one here is GitHub Actions. Now, all these things are CI CD tools. Now, all these ones are cloud providers. So you have your Azure, you have your Google Cloud Platform, and then you have your AWS platform, you have Docker. Now, this is Git, this is GitLab, this is GitHub. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question. First of all, thank you so I... much for uh, your time that you're spending to give us this knowledge. This knowledge. Um, um, I, wanted to ask, I don't know why I'm repeating myself, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to ask, when do you feel like you can now move on with other application after, you, after you're learning Linux? What, when do you feel like you you want to move on with the other applications? All right, uh, thank you for that question. Now, the truth is this. I tell people, uh, of course, if you if you go online and then, you know, maybe you're doing a research about DevOps, uh, there's a lot of prospect. I think the average salary for DevOps is around uh, maybe one or $3,000, they're about in the United States. Now, I said that to say this. What I tell people is this. Now, if you want to get into anything, right? If you want to learn something, uh, you need to commit a reasonable amount of time to it to learning it, right? 
Now, I watched the video today, and the video says if you do something uh, 18 minutes every day, uh, that's about 100 hours in a year, all right? And the report says that you are, you are likely to be 95% better than you know the other people, right? So what I'm saying is this. If you pick Linux, because in the course of the training that we, are, we, we offer as well, which is going to start later this month, we start with Linux. Now, what I tell people is for every training that you attend, it is not possible for them to cover the whole curriculum, right? And that is why for every class you go to, there's always a note, there's always a text that is recommended to you to say, all right, take this text, you can go and read up. And then if you read up and you have questions, you can come back to class, ask your questions, and then we respond to those questions, right? So the amount of time that you dedicate to learning these things is actually what will determine whether you're confident enough to say, now at this level that I am, I can understand Linux quite well. I know the basic commands. If somebody should wake me up from bed today and tell me, so what does system CTL do in Linux? I can tell them system CTL does this and this and that. Uh, if somebody should wake me up today and tell me, okay, uh, so what's the so what's the difference between a Red Hat Linux operating system and an Ubuntu operating system? I should be able to communicate clearly the difference between these versions of Linux, right? So the amount of time that you have committed into learning these things outside of the class is actually what will determine is actually what will determine if you are ready to move on to the next stage or not, right? That is yes. my response uh, to that. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and then. Yes, thank you. Uh, my last question is, um, uh, how how long are you going to do this course? And if if it is long, is it going to continue to be free or you have a paid version? Uh, I just want to know. All right, yes, that. there's a paid version, absolutely. Now, what I said earlier, I said, now we're doing three free classes, right? Uh, so we've started one today. So there's gonna be another one on the 18th and then there's gonna be another one on the 25th uh, of May. So the class is gonna start fully on the 31st of May, which is the paid version of it. And then I'm, I'm gonna send us a link to the website where you can get all the information about payment, about the curriculum and stuff like that. So the payment is actually something you can pay in installments. Now the training is gonna take five months because you, I am only going to be deceiving you if I tell you you can learn DevOps in two months or in three months or in four months. It's just going to be a pure lie. And of course, I'm not going to deceive anybody to tell them, oh, right, DevOps is simple. You can learn it in two months and you'll be fine. That would be a big lie because there's no way you want to learn all of the tools in the space of two months. Even if you don't have any job that you're doing, even if you're not, you don't have any commitment, it takes time to master things. All right, and that is why I tell people there is nothing that you you know there is uh, everything that you have today, everything that we use as human beings, right? The clothes that you wear and everything, they all have to go through process, right? So before the clothes you are putting on, before that clothes could become something you could put on, you know, there is the raw material version, and then the raw material was processed, and then on and on like that before it became something that you know was you know that looks appealing to you and say wow i like that shirt i want to buy it and then you put it on and you wear it but that shirt actually went through several processes okay and there were some of those production that you know the cost of production some of them would, be, would get lost and all of those kind of stuff right so it's going to take five months because it takes time to learn things and to you know gain mastery and all of that. and that's why i emphasized earlier that the amount of time you are willing to commit is also you know part of those things that will actually make uh, different, right? So that's why we're doing the three free classes so that people can, you know, be a part of the class. And then if you look at the three classes that we're, that we're going to do, if you feel that, okay, what these guys are doing is something interesting. I like the approach. I like the way they are taking this class. I want to be a part of it. Then you can make your own decision as regards, you know, joining the class or not, right? So that's why we're doing the three free classes, you know, prior to starting the class, and then let people make their decision if they want to join the class um, or not. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, yes, it did. Uh, I forgot to ask, uh, you, you, I, I wrote in uh, in uh, numbers, the way you said uh, people should take Linux, uh, Git, Docker, CICD, Pipeline, uh, Kubernetes. Now, when you get to Docker, because I see that you put Python uh, down the line, uh, if you take Docker and you want to write Docker, uh, let's say a file, 
don't you need some kind of coding uh, uh, knowledge? And if yes, uh, how will someone be able to uh, to write this uh, Docker file and then package it if he, he doesn't have this knowledge of uh, Python? All right. Now, uh, let me let me answer that like this. Okay. Now, let me just answer uh, Bayo Adiola, right? So, if you're comfortable with some of the tools. Uh, you can start at a different level. Yes, of course. If you're comfortable with Linux, if you're comfortable with Git, and if you're comfortable with AWS, you can pick it up at you know at another level and all that. So you don't have to you know start from. But what I, the only reason I just show this is because I just want people to get a clear understanding of what it takes you know uh, to learn DevOps. Because I see a lot of people. People want to learn Kubernetes. They want to learn you know all of these I, uh, you know all of these I N skills, right? And what people don't understand is this. When you get to an interview, believe me, honestly, it is the basic questions, right? The basic things. That's why people fail interview, not the big things. Because in an interview, some of those guys don't even ask you the, the deep things, right? Like Kubernetes, they don't ask you, okay, what is, you know, tell me about deployment in Kubernetes, tell me about, you know, secrets. And they don't ask you some of those things. They ask you the basic things. And so, and so people focus on the big things, you know, I want to learn Kubernetes and all of that, but they neglect, the basic things and then so people get to interview and they can't answer the basic questions and they're wondering okay what what was what the problem you know is right so that's why i am showing this that if you want to learn this thing or you want to gain mastery just make sure that your foundation is solid right so that the basics right is there you understand the basics so if somebody should wake you up anytime you can speak uh to the basics mm -hmm. right thank you now so thank you mm -hmm. to answer I, the other question i have a question have, about the Docker file and Python and things like that. Now, when it comes to DevOps, you, you are not a software developer, right? We need to we need we need to be clear on that. You are not a software developer, right? You are a DevOps engineer. So basically, you are standing between the development team and the people in operations, right? Uh, a kind of pattern, right? So in in DevOps, there are different pipelines that you're going to build out as a DevOps engineer. So in that pipeline, you're going to have you know testing. You're going to have you know code analysis. You are going to have deployment to test server and all those kind of things. So the reason you are learning Python is to be able to write some scripts, all right, for automation, not necessarily because you want to become a developer, all right. So that yes. is the reason why you are learning Python. So Python is just for you to be able to, you know, write scripts. So that's different from software development. So you are not a full-fledged software developer. You are only learning Python in order for you to be able to write scripts that can help you to automate right your you know your development process that's just basically what you're learning python and of course if you understand you know if, if you python is used for different things right python yes. for data science for machine learning for all those things so in devops python is basically used for scripting right basically for automation that's what python is used for and that is why you need to learn, um you know python thank you man thank you so much you i have a doubt can i ask that? please go ahead and ask your questions um, yeah, after the, this, we the, have to go into the class so that we don't take people's time. Just go ahead and ask. In the, in, in the premium course, you are asking and you are telling about how many services we will cover. Like we have in AWS, we have many services like EC2, ECS, S3, and Beanstalks. Apart from that, SQS, Lambda. So, how many services in the premium course we will cover? And apart from that, like will you? Uh, built a pipeline for deployment of uh, services in ECS clusters or through Jenkins. All right, yeah, so yes, uh, DevOps, yes, we're going to be doing uh, Jenkins, yes, and then we also have a bonus module, like I said, because uh, organizations are moving away from Jenkins, right? They are moving to GitLab, CI, CD, and GitHub Actions. So as part of the learning process, we're going to also touch on GitLab. That would, that's going to be a bonus module, right, for the class. Uh, so we're going to be touching on that. And then for AWS, yes, we're going to be looking at EC2. And that's why everything is going to follow a particular sequence. So we're going to start from the basics. So we're going to start from Linux, uh, things you need to know about Linux, then we move over to Git, and then to Docker, and you know we move over like that. So the services that are important for you to learn as a DevOps engineer, all right, we're going to be covering that. Of course, absolutely, we're going to be covering EKS, the Elastic Kubernetes service for AWS. We're going to be covering that. It's part of the things we're going to be covering. Okay, so we're going to be covering all of the necessary skills that you need. All right, for 
ஒரு <laughs> you know putting together everything we, we know bits and pieces of uh, these tools but how do how do it uh, it operates as a uh, as a part of software development life cycle right like uh, how all these tools are uh, stitched together do we have any kind of simulation kind of projects where we can uh, utilize these tools as a part of uh, your course just wanted to understand on Yes yeah that that's a very uh, that's a very good question absolutely we have now the approach that we are taking is the project based approach right so we are going to learn the tools independently and then we're going to of course connect all of uh, the tools together right and for every now i said when we when we about to start a class i said for every of the uh, class that we're going to be having we're going to be having an architecture that we're going to build out so that people can view and then can people can see right there's going to be an architecture for you know for every of the things that we'll be doing okay and then we're going to show you there's going to be projects at every point in time we're going to have projects that you're going to do that you can also do on your own and then we're not using simulation we're actually using aws so we're using real platforms because in a work environment you're not going to be simulating anything you're going to be dealing with the real stuff right so we're going to be dealing with aws whatever it is that we're going to be doing we're going to be using real you know servers right real systems uh, that's what we're going to be using so it's not going to be any simulation of any sort it's going to be um, the real operating system that we're going to be using okay so that's uh, what we're going to be using all right uh my uh partner is here as well uh, mr kunle can you just say hi to everyone uh, mr kunle is on the call it's uh uh is a consultant yes. in CCS uh, America so just say hi please yes um good evening everybody nice to have you guys yeah good evening mr tolu good evening good evening yes sir thank you for joining sir we appreciate your presence um, thanks so much all right so let's uh let's go over to the console and let's uh build out our architecture all right so, all right so now if you look at my console here i have two servers that are running already uh, i have a jenkins server and i have a nexus server running um already right okay now because of time i'm just going to do a quick walk through uh, regarding what and what we need in order to install your nexus server in order to install your jenkins server now jenkins is basically your ci cd server uh, your code into uh, code you know integration and code deployment server and nexus it's an artifact um, repository uh, kind of server so where you can store you know artifacts and all of that so we're going to just look seeing basically what an artifact is uh shortly what it means so my servers are right here i have my jenkins right here and then i have my nexus server right here if you look at the address that's the uh, Nexus on the Jenkins server. So now the first thing you want to do is that you want to let me just uh, just a minute. All right, the first thing you want to do is that you want to go into your AWS account and then you want to provision you know servers, right? So you want to have a server for Jenkins, you want to have a server for Nexus. So how do you do that? Uh, of course, you go to launch instance. So if you click on launch instance, then you follow all of those parameters right here. um so you type in all of these things uh, all the details for those who are familiar with AWS you can put in the name of the server right here so if i want to launch a nexus server you put the name here and give it a name nexus server and then you can choose all of this ami so you have amazon linux you have ubuntu you have windows of course we're going to run it on ubuntu uh, because it's uh, an application that runs better on um on linux right so there's the amazon linux 2023 mi version and now one thing about nexus uh, if you're running your nexus server is that it requires a minimum 
I think, post uh, virtual CPUs and, of course, 4 gig of, of, of memory, right? Now, if you look at the one that I have here, the next server that I have here, you will see that I have um, something like a warning sign here. So if I click on that warning sign, basically what it's telling me is that the whole system is allocating a maximum of two cores to the application, and it says a minimum of four is recommended. And so that explains why. Uh, so after you're done with all of this page, you can launch your instance and then you open all the message reports. I'm going to show us that shortly. Now, so with your next server, if you look at it, I'm using a T3 medium, right? Mm -hmm. So the T3 medium actually gives me, um, I think, four gig of RAM and, yeah, four two, gig of RAM. Okay. and two virtual CPUs, right? And of course, my Nexus is still complaining that that is not enough. So if you launch your Nexus, because of course, you know, some people may want to leverage the T2 micro, right? Which is covered under the free tier. So if you use the T2 micro for your installation, your Nexus is not going to run. You can try it after the class. Your Nexus is simply not uh, going to run. So you need to use at least a T3 uh, medium, all right, to launch your instance. Of course, the T3 medium is not covered under the free tier. So you, you expect to pay a few. Oh, it's, it's not free. Or of course, it's not free. So this one that I'm running now is actually costing me some cents, right? So it's not free. It's not covered under the free tier. But of course, if you want to run the Nexus server, you need to have um, you need to have your uh, at least mm -hmm. something that is higher than T2 medium, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, your Jenkins as well. Uh, your Jenkins can manage your T2 micro, but of course, uh, it can, you know, it, it will not also, you know, run very well as expected, right? So you can also use a T3 medium for that. So what I do basically is that, you know, I shut it down anytime I don't need it, and then I put it back on anytime I need it. So let's just do a walkthrough of, you know, how to install um, a Nexus server, right? Let me just show us that quickly. Uh, so let's say I want to have a Nexus. Uh, underscore, let's just say server. So what is the purpose we are installing Nexus? All right, the purpose of installing the Nexus is because we have an application, right, that we want to deploy into the Nexus server. We want to package an application, right? If your programmers, once they are done with their own application, when they are, once they are done with, um, what do you call it now? Once they are done with their development, right? The source code needs to be packaged into what you can call an intermediary code, right? Maybe like a, you know, an intermediary code that you can run to test the application if it's working, if there are any corrections uh, that you need to make, right? So that's why is, you need the Nexus server. Is, right? is it similar to converting it into the jar file or something? Exactly, exactly. So that jar file is what we want to publish. Which will be executable now. Exactly, exactly. So you got that correctly. So that jar file that you talked about is what we want to move, is what we want to push into uh, the Nexus repository, all right? So that from the Nexus repository, those that may have a need for the jar file, they can go there to pull it and then use it uh, for whatever they need it uh, for, all right? So that's why uh, we need that, okay? So let's just use, uh, let's go with Ubuntu. Uh, for those raising up their hands, let's just finish this so that you can ask your questions later so let's launch our server first and then so if i so let's go with the t3 t3 medium so that will give you two virtual cpus and four gigs so if you as you as you can look at it here it's not covered under the free tier so it's going to cost you a few cents and of course the pricing is right here so for the linux it's going to cost you 0 0.047 per hour so which is still you know reasonable right to uh, very reasonable. So I already have my key pair created here. So if you don't have one, you can also click here and then create your key pair. And of course, I can edit this place and choose a public subnet. I already have a security group configured, so I don't have to create another one again. Um, so I can go with uh, this one here. I think. So I'll click on launch instance. Do you have any specification for the security group? Yes, I'm going to show us uh, the one I have on my on my side. So for your security group, there are a few ports that you need to open for security group. Uh, your Nexus actually runs on port 8081. So that means you need to open up port 8081, all right, for your Nexus server to run. If you look at the one I have here, I have my 8081 right here running. And for Jenkins, Jenkins uses port 8080, right? So if, I, if you're configuring your Jenkins, port 8080 must be opened up on your uh, security group end. And for your Nexus, you need to also open up uh, port 8081, 
All right, so you need to open Autosport up in the security group. All right, so uh, Nexus Server 1 is running. So if I click on this right here, I can, I can click on um, My quick question is like, okay, please. Um, for your security group, how do we open the ports through the uh, the AWS console? All right, uh, that's a good question. So let me show us that. Uh, I'm just trying to, because of time, I don't want this class to be too long. So here you have the security groups, right? So if I click on this here, uh, these are a few security groups that I have created. So I can come here to create security group. All right, I'll give my security group a name, uh, any name that I know that makes uh, sense, right? So here I can call it, uh, let's say Nexus, I can call it Nexus Security Group, and then I can do the description. Let me just copy this, right? I can read the description to say, allow a Nexus on port 8081, you can say that. And then you choose your VPC, right? The VPC that your Nexus server is connected on. Okay, so you choose a VPC and then you have the inbound rules, right? So you click on add rules. Uh, of course, your Nexus is gonna be a custom TCP uh, because all these ones here are predefined already. So if I choose HTTP, the port is already predefined, so I can't use that. So I need to go with um, custom TCP and then I put a port that I want to open up here. So 8081, that's the port I want to open up. And then the source. So the source basically talks about uh, from where can the application be accessed, who and who can access your application and from what location, right? So there are a few, you know, you can define different sources. So here you have CIDR block. So if I go with the first one, what I'm saying basically with that is anybody can access, all right, my server from anywhere, right? That's the first one. And then if I want it to be a bit more secure, you know, I want to, I'm security conscious, all right, I can also connect it to a security group. So basically what I'm saying is that the traffic that would come you know, into my instance that has the security group attached, all right, must come from uh, this security group, all right? So, but in a normal, in an ideal setting, you're not gonna be using this, right? Because this is not secure. This is opening it up to everybody, right? So in a normal ideal setting, in a normal work environment, you are gonna probably tie it with your company's um, IP address, right? So if I click here and I say my IP, now this is my public IP address right here. So I can tie you my public IP address. So which means basically nobody is gonna be able to access all right, my applications, okay? That the security group is connected to, except they are within my organization, okay? So that's the best practice, right? What you do within an organization. Okay, but for practice sake, maybe you're just trying to practice and all of that, you can go with this other one here. So basically it says anywhere. So basically anybody can access that um, application, right? So that's the that's this one, okay? And then for security group, uh, one of the questions that you can get asked in an interview is, now when they ask you in an interview, what is a security group? Uh, you, don't, you don't just want to tell them it's a firewall, right? They know it's a firewall, but they are looking for something. So basically, your security group is what you can is call. Is it stateful now? Like exactly, uh, if we can, exactly. Yeah. It's a stateful, you know, kind of firewall, and it works at your instance level, right? So it is what you use to protect your instance. Okay. So stateful in the sense that you only need to define the inbound. You don't need to touch anything when it comes to the outbound, right? So whatever you allow, you know, in automatically is allowed out by default. Right, and that's why your security group is stateful. Okay, your network ACL on the other hand, that one is stateless because you have to define both inbound and both unbound, and that works at the v at the VPC level of things. All right, so that's just basically um, that. So it's awesome. a firewall. Thank you very much. It's a firewall. It works at the instance level, and it is stateful because you only need to define your inbound. You don't need to define anything on the outbound, right? So that's just what your security group is. So once you're done with this, you can click on create. And so once you create it, then when you're creating your instance, you just pick it up and attach it to, you know, your instance that you just created. All right, so that's clear. Okay, so let's go back to our instance and let's connect to this Nexus server. I just wanna show us a few things regarding this Nexus and then we move on uh, from there. 
So these are Nexus server. I can click on connect from here, and then I can use instance connect to connect to my Nexus server, all right? But of course, before I can use instance connect, again, I need to ensure that port 22, which is the SSH port, is actually opened up. All right, so this is my page right here. It's uh, up and running, so I can start you know, typing whatever it is that I want to type here. I can start installing anything that I want to do. Now, what you do basically when you're dealing with a Linux operating system, uh, anytime you want to, before you install any application, right, on a Linux operating system, the first thing you need to do is to update your package manager, right? Now, Linux has different variants, right? So there's Ubuntu, there's Debian, and there are a lot of other variants, right? Now, so how do you, you know, what's the difference between these things? Let's just, you know, try to talk about that. Now, the difference between whether you're using an Ubuntu, a Red Hat, uh, a CentOS, a SUS, or Fedora, or whatever, the, the basic difference between all those variants of Linux is the package manager, right? The package manager understands that how do you install applications on these, you know, operating systems, right? Now, package managers, for example, if you're using a Windows system, your Windows use exe, right, dot exe. So you download applications at dot exe and then you double click on it and then you run into your Windows instance, right? Now, uh, for Linux, they have different variants. Now, Debian and Ubuntu, all right, they belong to the same family, right? In fact, Ubuntu is actually a derivative or a variant of Debian, right? So they use the same package managers, the same package manager. So basically they use what you call the apt, right? So if I type apt install, apt get, I'm sure some of us are familiar with you know, all of that. So they use apt for their own installations. Now for those uh, who are using, maybe if I'm using an Amazon Linux, Amazon Linux is actually you know, something that they derive from the Red Hat or the CentOS um, um, variant, right? So they use the YUM package manager. All right, so if you're using Amazon Linux, if you want to install anything on Amazon Linux, what you do is you do YUM, all right? YUM update, YUM install, YUM this, YUM that. So that's the package manager, right? So for Red Hat, for CentOS, for SUSE, all right, they use the YUM. And for those who are using Fedora and some other variants of Linux, uh, there's what you call the DNF. That's the package manager they use. So for Linux, the package manager is actually the thing that really distinguishes the different variants. Of you know of the Linux um, that you have available, right? But of course, all the other commands like ls, cd, you know, make directory, all those basic commands like grep and all those kind of stuff is still the same across all the Linux operating system, right? So you don't did have you to. Say, did you say Windows use DNF as well? No, no, no. Windows uses exe, right? Windows uses two. There's the exe and there's the MSI installer for Windows, right? There's the MSI installer for Windows and there's the EXE, executable you know, file format for Windows, right? The DNF that I talked about is actually for Fedora uh, version of Linux. You know, there's this Fedora version of Linux. That one, they use the DNF, right? But for Red Hat, for SUSE Linux, for CentOS, they use the YUM. The same thing with Amazon Linux, which is the YUM application you know, manager. And for Ubuntu and Debian, they use the apt uh, application manager. So, the, and of course, since they use different package managers, right? They are going to, of course, use different repositories, okay? So that's why the same way you're going to install something on Ubuntu is going to be different from how you're going to install it on Red Hat, right? Because they have different repositories, okay? So we need to just understand that. So the first thing you want to do if you're working with any Linux operating system is to do what? Is to update your package manager. It's very important. You update your package. So how do you do that? You just basically do apt update. All right. So that will run some a few things for me. Basically, just checking if I have any updates that I need to install. So this that I'm doing now will ensure that whatever application that I'm running on my Linux, all right, I'm actually running the latest version of that application, right? So because I've updated the package manager. So if I want to install anything on this Linux operating system, it's going to, of course, give me the latest version of that application, right? So you can choose to update. Uh, or, you know, it's, it's telling us here that we have 45 packages that can be upgraded. We can choose to do that, but of course, that's not necessary. We have already updated our package manager. So the next thing we want to do now is to now do our installation. Now for Nexus, 
uh, you need to have Java installed on your operating system if you want to run Nexus. And so the Nexus uses uh, the Java uh, the Java SDK version 8. That's what your Nexus uses. And then you also want to install your Net Tools um, as well. You want to also make sure that your Net Tools is installed as well. So let's quickly run through uh, all of these things. All right. So uh, if I want to install my Java, I can just type Java right here. And then uh, if I type in Java, it tells me that Java cannot be found, but it gave me some suggestions, right? So it gave me a few suggestions that, okay, it's not here, but of course you can install them using, you know, all of these options. So the one I'm going to go with that will work with my Nexus is actually the first one that I have right here, all right? That's the first one. So that's the one I'll go with. I'll just copy that and then I'll just paste that right here. All right. So I'm going with this one. So here, uh, after the install, I'll put my um, iframe Y so that if he wants to ask me any question, basically, I'm just saying, you know what, we'll just go ahead and install this thing. I'm okay with all of it. So it will install the Java for me right away. So you need Java installed on your um, operating system before you can run your Nexus. All right, so my Java is installed. So if I type Java, for example, and I do version and all that, uh, it can't find it. Okay, so let's do Java uh, version. Let's see if this will work. All right, so that worked. So it tells us that, okay, uh, Java version is here. This is what it has installed for us, which is okay. Now, after that is done, we need to also install what you call the net tools. A net tool is basically um, something that you can use to debug, you know, some kind of network um, configurations, right? If you want to check maybe your network log, what is going on with your application, what ports are opened, you know, on this application and things like that, you want to use your net tools to decode um, those kind of information. All right, so the next thing we're going to be doing is that we want to install net tools. So if I type net tools again, it's going to give me, if I just type net tools, it's not there. But it tells me I can install it with this, but that's not the net tools that I'm looking for. So I'm just going to do apt install. Since I already know what I'm looking for, I'm just going to type apt install again, net iframe tools. And so that will also check the net tools for me and install it. All right, so that is also been installed. Now, the next thing you want to do now is that you want to install um, your Nexus, right? So now your Nexus is something that you can get uh, from this page right here. If I copy and paste this right here, you can get your Nexus, um, your Nexus, this is the page, this is the documentation page. So you can download the repository from here. So I think the latest one here is uh, 3.53. So you can download, so for Windows, you can download here for Windows, you can download for Linux and for Mac, you can also download for Mac from here as well. All right, so um, I already have a way of getting my own Nexus. So I have a few of this that I need to do. Okay, so what I can do now is that I need to change my directory because I need to install my, excuse me, I need to install my Nexus in what you call the OPT directory, right? So I need to change the directory to that I need to change my directory to that place so that I can install my Nexus right inside of that directory. So I'll go into my OPT, <clears throat> change directory to OPT. And then for my Nexus, I will type in a few commands. All right, I have to type in a few commands that I need for my Nexus um, installation. All right, I'm trying to see if... So how do you know which which uh, directory do you want to go? How do you choose? A, do we have like a book where we can go find all these uh, little things, uh, you know, technical stuff? Or how do you get to this point? point? Yeah. All right. Now, the re how you know is now for every application. Now, one of the beautiful things about, you know, all these open source applications is this. The beautiful thing about them is that they have a robust documentation, right? So yes. if you go on the Nexus uh, platform and you read their documentation, they're going to give you step by step on how you can install um, these things, right? So if you go through their documentation, you get to know, okay, this is how to, to install this, this is how to install this application and none of that, all right? So if I go over to the first documentation here, 
uh, this is the documentation. It tells you, you know, there are a few things that you can learn uh, from the documentation. So all of those information sometimes are available on the documentation. So that's how you know uh, what directory to install it, how to install it, and all those kind of information uh, that you are asking. All right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, are you saying? Um, but you you have you have that file installed on your on your own uh, system. That's why you do see the um and the name of the file, right? Is that what you're saying? I don't get. No, the OPT is not. I don't have OPT installed now. If you have, if any, if anybody is familiar with Linux, say you will know that there are some folders that automatically, for example, your etc folder when you install a Linux system, etc folder automatically is part of you know the folders that you have, right? The var folder, your var folder is part of the folders that you have on Linux, right? So it's it's pretty simple. If I go back now, this is the home directory, right? This is the root directory. If I type in ls, now all of these folders, I didn't create any of them, right? I didn't create any of them. Oh, so you have, you, have oh, the oh. B, you have the boots, you know, you have all of this folder created for you automatically by the Linux Wait, operating system. Why, okay, whenever you installed a Linux operating any system, Linux all, 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 this, install, all this file, all, all, all these folders, exactly. All this okay, so this there. OPT is constant, right? It's something that if you, you look have. at it, the OPT is there. I didn't create any OPT folder. It's oh, there. yeah, I see it. I see it. It's yeah. Possible. So it's there. Yeah, so you can you see know, that your like, folder is also there. Your USR folder is there. Now, now all this folder they have the they have information that they hold, right? There's some installation that you do that goes into some of those folders. Okay. So uh -huh. all those folders are there. So you don't create them by own self, right? So they are there automatically. So we don't need to go to that website again. We can just do this straight away. Yeah, you just go there and then you change your directory to OPT. Okay. And then you do what you call WGET. So you can do WGET. And then right here, I can actually copy can this. Ask a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I think this explains the different um, directories and what they are doing. Like the OPC, I say OPC, the bin directory, and you know, can you please explain what they do? Uh, now, in I want the, to that the, the different directories do different things. Yes, yes. Now, in the main class, that these, are, have, these are five structures in Linux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are five structures. Yes, yeah, there are five structures. Uh, now, all of those directories, all those five structure, the file system of Linux, and all those things, there are things that we're going to, install, of course, discuss about you know, in the main class, the class pop up, right? You know, because if you want to be breaking all those things down, we're going to be here forever, right? And we don't right. to do it, uh, forever. So in the main class, we're going to be breaking down all those different file structures, what they do, you know, your ETC folder, what are some of the things that you have in your ETC folder, what are some of the things you have in your VAR, in your USR folder. Like the Java that we installed, you know, just now is actually, be, if you want to find your Java file, it's actually somewhere in your user, your USR folder. That's where the Java gets installed, right? So you need to all just know. But in the main class, these are some of the discussions uh, that we're going to be having. So if I want to install this, I can just basically, all right, just do sonatype nexus three, and then I can type in. We can we can see your. Uh... My screen is here. You can see my screen. This is my screen here. Uh -oh. can... You are not sharing the EC two console, like. Yeah, I want to copy this. I want to copy this. Okay. This is what I want to copy. Because we want to install the Nexus, so I need to copy this uh, information that we have right here. Okay, so I can just copy this link, and then uh, so let me copy. So if I go back to my EC2, so I'm doing wget right here, and then I can paste it here, and then that would um, download the Nexus for me. So if I do ls, so my Nexus uh, has been downloaded. So the next thing that I want to do, of course, is that I want to unzip um, this application, right? I want to unzip it. And so to do that, you want to use what you call um, the tar unzip. Now, all these things are things that we're going to talk about in depth in the course of the class, right? But of course, there, there are different ways to unzip things, you know, in Linux. So you, so you can use a tar, depending on, so like this file that we downloaded now is a tar.gz file. So there's a way you unzip such a file, right? So we can just do tar, and then you do your tar uh, minus. You call you have your minus here z s uh, vf. 
All right? So just these are things we're going to uh, talk about in the course of the class, right? So let's not uh, give ourselves a necessary edict about it. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm just basically now, the, what I'm just doing basically is that this thing is bundled, like, you know, you know, it's compressed, right? So I want to try and, you know, uncompress it, if I can use that word, right? So that I can access the application that I have in there, right? So I press enter, so it's unzipping it, uh, unzipping it right now, okay? So if I do LS again, so I have two folders, so I have the Nexus 35001, and then I have the Sonar type work. Now the Nexus, now the Nexus 3 that you have here, this one that you have here is actually, you know, what holds your application. And then the Sonar type works is what holds some kind of uh, configuration. So like your blob store and some other stuff that we're going to be looking at is actually inside of this Sonar type work. All right, so we've unzipped it. Uh, so the next thing you want to do now is to, you know, uh, if you want to start your Nexus, there, there are ways by which you can start your Nexus. But of course, you can create a Nexus user, right? You can create what you can call a Nexus user, right? You can create a Nexus user. So let's see how we can do that, how we can create a Nexus user. So basically, all I need to do here is to just to say hard user, right? So I'll just say hard user. Right, add user, and then my username is Nexus. That's the user that I want to add. So enter. Uh, it will want me to go through a few steps so I can put in my Nexus password. It will ask me to retype it. Okay, so full name, I can just put Nexus there, and then all those things. I don't need them. Um, yes, the information is correct. Then, so I have created my user. Now, the next thing I want to do is that I want to give my user that I just created permissions, you know, to access these folders that I have right here. Now, these two folders, I want my user to have access to it. I don't want to be using my root folder to access all these folders, right? So that's why I've created another user. Okay, so I'm just going to do chown, right? So chown basically means I am giving you ownership, right? That's just ch own. That's what it means. So ownership is what it means, right? In Linux, so if you see ch own, you're just basically talking about ownership, right? So I'm, tr I'm trying to transfer ownership to my Nexus user, All right? Now in Linux, there's what you call the user, and then every user has you know a group that they belong to in Linux, right? So I'm going to do Nexus, so that's the user, and the Nexus that's the that's kind of the group. All right. So now what do I want to do for this ownership? I'm basically trying to provide ownership for two things, right? So Nexus, I can add, I can add them as just recursive. So Nexus uh, 3.05 font that we have here. So I want to give this Nexus user permission on that folder. And then the next permission is going to be on the Sona type work, right? So it's going to be on that Sona type work. And then I'll type in enter again. So basically what I've done basically now is that I have given my Nexus user permission to work on that folder, right? Now, the next thing that you want to do is that you want to edit a few, uh, just one file in your Nexus file, right? So what I would do right now is to type in what you call uh, a Linux editor. There are different Linux editor that you can use. There's the nano editor and then there's the uh, Vim editor, and all of these editors are things we're going to discuss about. So Nano, uh, so I'm going to open up uh, something within Nexus. So Nexus, um, so then I'm going to go into the Vim folder, and I have what you call the Nexus.rc, right? So I'm going to open that up. So if you look at what we have here, it's basically telling us uh, if you look at what we have here, if I can zoom it a bit. So run as what? Uh, I say run as a user. So that is grayed out. So I need to um, uncomment that. So I'll type that. And then I want to run this application as Nexus, right? You know, I've created a user just now. Okay. So I want to run it as Nexus. So that's the only thing I need to type in. I need to type in. And then I'll do my control O to save, right? I'm saving it right now. And then 
I'll do my control X. Okay, control X to quit out of that environment. All right. So how do you choose between v VIM and, uh, and uh, Nano? Well, for me, I think I prefer Nano because it's for me, I just find it easier. But uh, for somebody who is, uh, if you're a professional in Linux, right? If you, you know, well, they do the same thing basically. They are text, you know, they are editors, right? But Nano is a bit cleaner. Uh, it's not too complex. For your Vim, it's a bit complex, right? So whichever one that you want to use, you can use Vim, you can use Nano, all right? You get the same result at the end of the day. Okay, but I just used to use Nano because it's still easier to work with compared to the other uh, uh, editors, right? So, all right, so let's start our next list and let's see. So we just started up and then that'll be all. So if you want to start up your Nexus, let's switch our user. So switch user to Nexus. We just created it, all right? So we'll switch user to Nexus right now. Now, how do you start your Nexus? How do you start it up? Um, very pretty simple, all right? So you go to your OPT directory. So you just do OPT, and then you navigate to your Nexus folder. You go to Bing, then you go to Nexus again, and then you type in start. All right, starting Nexus. Now, how do you check if your Nexus has started? How do you check you know, the information as regards uh, this Nexus server that we just started? So you can type in this command right here, ps uh, ops. This is a minus command to check for uh, if a service has started successfully or not. So I'm going to use a pipe symbol. So the pipe symbol is basically means I just want to narrow it down to a particular application, right? I'm not trying to check every service that I have running in my environment, right? So I want to narrow it down to a particular application, right? So that's why I'm using the pipe and then grep, right? So grep basically means what I'm looking for is this. So the grep is just something that helps you to be kind of precise uh, with what you're looking for. Right, so grep, Nexus. So what I'm looking for exactly is Nexus and nothing more. So anything that is not Nexus, of course, don't open, don't open up the process for me. So that's just basically what I'm saying. So if I put in enter, so this shows me a kind of log and then it shows me that my Nexus actually started, right? But of course, this is not, you know, providing us a lot of information as regards if our Nexus is, you know, is up and running or not. Uh, we need to be able to check if our Nexus has started successfully and what, on what port has this Nexus application started, right? So we need to verify that information as well. All right, so the next thing I need to do, and that was why we installed the NetStart earlier, right? That's why we installed the NetStart earlier. So I'm going to do NetStart, or sorry, the Net tools that we installed earlier, that's how we installed it. So I'm going to do NetStart, I think LMPT, so that is just basically saying, you know, I want to check uh, processes that are running at the moment. Uh, that's just basically what I'm saying, LMPT. Okay, so that would narrow it down to my Nexus server. So if you look at it here, this is showing us that uh, our application is running and then I can see the process ID. Now, if you look at the process ID, the process ID is 4393. And so if I scroll up here, I will see that uh, my Nexus is also currently opened up on what? On 4393. So right here, it tells me that my Nexus is opened up and then on port 8081. So my Nexus server is accessible. So if I come here now and I copy this public IP address right here, uh, let me copy and paste it somewhere. Okay, so and then I need to put in the colon 8081. So, <clears throat> all right, so if you look at it here, it tells you that your Nexus server is actually up. So you can see that we deployed our Nexus server successfully, our Nexus server is up, and then we can start using our Nexus and server. Uh, now, these are, the kind, these are the repository formats. So these are the formats uh, that your Nexus server supports, uh, right? So these are the stuff that it supports. So you may want to check this. Uh, all right, so how do you log in into this guy? So if you click on sign in, uh, by default, your Nexus has a default password 
that is stored in this location. So right now right here, all these um, apps, um, compose, all these things, these are the kind of package, right? The kind of uh, artifacts, you know, so to say, that your Nexus server can store for you, right? So which means you can push, you know, a Python application into your Nexus server, you can push Docker image into your Nexus server, you know, all these things, these are the supported repository formats that your Nexus application, you know, support. So it's basically just, just like somebody mentioned earlier, you know, your JAR file that you create, you know, after you compile your application, you can push all those JAR files into your Nexus um, repository, okay? So that's what's- uh, Is it like an artifactory repository? Uh, yes, yes. We like have artifactory Yes, yes, artifactory repository, yeah, yeah. It's in that family as well. It's in that family as well. So you have the JPFrog or JFrog or something, then you have artifactory, so is in that JFrog uh, uh, is one more uh, 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 like a tool, right? Uh, which also yes. manages these uh, artifacts. Exactly. So it's also an example of the artifactory. So there are different tools. So that's why you know in DevOps you just need to know, you know, the things that you need to learn. But of course, Nexus is a bit more popular compared to some of those ones. And of course, whatever whatever tool that you use at the end of the day, you know, actually boils down to the organization that you're working with. That's just the simple truth, right? But it's just, it's just good when you have the knowledge you know, broadened so that if you get into an organization, even if you're not using Nexus, even if you're using ActivePath repository or something like that, right, you already have an idea of what a repository is and how it works so that at least you can fit in into whatever it is that they're using. Okay, so let's just sign in. Um, that's just on that. Um, okay. <laughs> So if Hello? I click on sign in. Hello, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Um, are two people able to log in at the same time? Because I know you only created one user Nexus, and I was able to go to this uh, IP address on port 8081, and I'm able to log into uh, Nexus, but I don't know if I can log in as well to see what you're doing, like to actually see what's well, inside. You, you can actually log in because- uh, Oh, okay. Right, you don't know, the password is not even available. Right? Oh, okay, okay, gotcha, okay. thank you. But of course you can see this page. If you type in yes. the IP address and the port, it should take you to this page automatically. Exactly. So we're using a public IP address, so you'll be able to access it. So. Okay, thank you. All right, so now Nexus is telling us that um, since we have installed it, the default password is saved somewhere in this um, sonar type pop directory. Uh, so we need to go there and get the default password and then we'll change it once we save it. So let's let's go grab the password for this so that we can log in into Nexus. So let me just clear my screen. It looks a bit, uh, so let's clear that up. So uh, how do I get it? So I'll just do cat. Now cat is a command in Linux that if you want to view, you know, something in a file, right, you can use cat to view uh, something in that file. So you don't have to do nano to check it. So you can use cat to just say, okay, I want to view the content of this file, then cat can do that uh, for you. So, the so you have your sonar type work uh, folder here, and then the part is Nexus. So now if you do tab, right it will show you some other things that you have you in that folder password. right so what we are looking for is the admin the password That's yeah what we it's already do. there right there, so if password. i if i yeah. press in enter i can do cat now and then do admin dot password so it no, in the first the time also password. you could able to do it but uh that's what i thought like uh, initially you are a less privileged user right so that's why it was not showing up the path no, 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 when that you was type a that was not the case. If you're even if you're not using a root user, you can cut. Cut. You don't need sudo to review, copy, copy. except it's uh, a file that uh, requires some kind of permission, right? But for this kind of file, you don't need to be an admin user. Even okay, if I use well. a Nexus user, it will show me that. So this is the password here. You can just highlight it and then you copy it, and you can come here to paste it in, and then you sign in, and then of course, the first thing you see here is yes, to tell okay. you to change the password, right? So then you can now use whatever password that you want to use. So I'm just gonna use a simple uh, password, okay. All right, so just a simple uh, password. Of course, you don't want um, anonymous access. In a production environment, you don't want anybody to just come into your environment and 
and do certain stuff, right? So that's it. You configure your Nexus, and then your Nexus is up and running. So you have a lot of information here that uh, we will not be able to go into. So if you look at it also, I have the check mark here, and it's telling me the minimum is four, but of course with two, it will still run, but it's just telling you that ideally you should have uh, four, um, you know, four virtual CPUs, right? So that's how you will install your uh, Nexus. Real quick question, Mr. Ayo. Okay. Um, my screen was lagging. How did you get here again, please? Yeah, I just shared my screen. I have this application right here on my system. So what I just did was to share my screen and all of that. Now, okay. what I just quickly want to explain because uh, we are running out of time, right? We are running quickly, uh, we're running out of time. So I'll just have to be fast with this because I'm still gonna show us the Jenkins part as well. So now if you look at this pom.xml, now this is the source. If you look at here, this right here, and uh, let me one. see if I can zoom this, is it possible? Yeah, impossible. If you look at what you have here, this is the Java application that we have here. It was generated by this application? Right, this is the application that we have right here, and this is the application that we're trying to package, right? So we're trying to package this application, it has some information here. So basically, the application is just gonna display, well, welcome to Java making application for us, right? And so this is the application that we're trying to package. So it's in the source folder, right? But now if you're trying to package this application and you're trying to make out a JAR file from it um, so that you can run that JAR file, you know, the JAR file is executable, right? So you can run it on your um, system, okay? That's where the Maven comes in. Now for all of these build tools, they have their own um, way or their own kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, application that they use that you can use to package, you know, all these Java applications, right? Now for Python, Python uses the PIP for its own package management. Uh, your Java can use this Gradle, you can use Maven, and um, uh, .NET, they use the, the net NU, um, NU get or something that what .NET uses. So now the pump XML is what Maven uses. Now all these things that you have here, all these, um, uh, build command, plugin commands, all the Spring Framework boot and all that. These are things that, of course, nobody types all of these things by themselves, right? You actually can go to the Maven portal. They have a repository, right? Let me just see if I can show us uh, that very quickly. They have a repository that you can go to and download, you know, all of this. Um, let me just go to just a minute. Let me show us what I'm talking about. So here, if you go to Maven repository, right? So right here, you can download all of those, you know, the POM XML, whatever it is that you need basically to build your application, you can get it here in the repository, right? So if I click on Maven repository, it will show me, you know, all of the repository. So if you are building a Java application, you have Java specifications here, you have all of these things, you know, right here that you can download and then copy into your code to build your application. So it's not something that you have to memorize or you have to, you know, cram something or know it by force and all that. No, they have all the extensions right here. So if you look at I it, have, the... I have done it yesterday on uh, Spring Boot Initializer, same thing. All right, all right. Thank you for that information. So you can get all the details from here, right? So it's not something you have to memorize. I just thought to you know say that so that people don't see uh, the XML and then people are wondering, oh, do I have to know all of these? Do I have to memorize it and all of that? So you don't have to memorize all those things. So you can actually get it from the Maven repository, all right? So you can get it from the Maven um, repository, okay? So, and then if you, so now the question now is, how do you run this application? Now, the first thing that you want to do is that you want to install the Maven application itself, right? You want to install your Maven application because you need to have the Maven installed on your system. And of course, before you can also install your Maven as well, you need to have your Java installed on the system. Just like, just like we installed Java for the Nexus repository, you also need to install, Java must be installed on your system also to run um, the Maven application, right? 
So if I, let me show us something real quick here. If I go back to my portal here, in my, if I go back to my instance right here, all right, okay, my instance is still top. All right, good. So now if I, let me just back out. So if I back out, if I want to install my Maven, so if I type in MVN here, uh, it tells me MVM is not found, but it tells me that I can install it using apt install Maven, right? So you need to install Maven on your system before you can use you know, the Maven command. So if you, right here, if I do apt install um, Maven, right? So that will install the Maven application for me. So you can see it's already downloading and installing that uh, for me already, right? So my Maven has been installed. So if I do MVN now and I do version to check the version of my Maven, I can see that my Maven version is um, uh, Apache Maven 3.63. And if you look at the home directory for somebody who was asking about all those uh, you know, fast structures, so you can see that the Maven is installed inside your USR share and then you have your Maven. So the Java application is this. So once you have your Maven installed, then you can begin to now run uh, the Maven command. So Maven build, a Maven test, you know, Maven package, you know, and all those kind of uh, Maven commands, right? So you can begin to install, um, can begin to use that. So let's right here in the source uh, code. So our developers, they've developed it, they've given it to us. It's our own job to build it up and test it and be sure that what they have built is actually something that is working and all of that. So all I need to do is I can do sudo su just to be in my roots uh, folder so that there are no permission issues, right? So I can, right? So I'll, I mean, I'm, I'm the root now. So what I need to do is I can say MVN and then I can say package. Are you Basically, using IntelliJ? Um, no, 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 I'm using Visual Studio Code, but you can use IntelliJ too. If you have IntelliJ, you can use IntelliJ yes, as yes. well. Yes. IntelliJ is also very good. So you can use that okay. also if you have it, you can download the community edition and use that. But I'm using VS Code, all right? So you can just type in Maven package and then so Maven package basically will run through your application, right? And that's why you have you need the pump XML installed. So you can see that Maven is getting some information from the Maven repository, right? So it's getting some things from the Maven repository. So if you look at what you have here, all right, it was able to get some things from the uh, from the repository itself. So all these things are things that Maven got, you know, downloaded, test compiled, logins, and all this kind of stuff. All right, so Maven, all right, the application was built successfully without any issues. So if I expand this right here, I can see my jar file being packaged for me here. So this .jar file is what you refer to as an artifact, right? This .jar file is what you refer to as an artifact. And that is what we want to try as much as possible to push uh, to our Maven repository, all right? Now, because our time is already fast spent, because if you want to push this to your repository, right, you can actually test this. If you want to test it, it's pretty simple. Uh, you can just do Java. Since you already have Java installed, you can do Java, then I think jar, and then you go into the target folder. The target folder is where your application is installed. And then you can do Java, the jar, blah, 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 and things like that. And then if everything is right, so the Spring Framework is, is up and running, and then uh, so it tells me here that the application started. So it tells me that my application is running. And then, and then of course, they tell you the port that the application is running on, right? It's using the Apache Tomcat server, and then the application is running on port 8080. So it's running on my local host right now. So if I want to check that application and see if the application... Is... So if I do local host... Quick question, Mr. Ayo. Please go ahead, son. Um, so you said we need to have Java installed on our local machine and as well as on the EC2 instance where we are running this application, right? Yes, yes. Now, okay. for running your Nexus, you need to have Java installed because it's a Java application. Nexus is, you know, developed using Java. So you need to have Java right. installed. Your Maven is also an application that was developed using Java. So you need Java installed on your local system as well. All right. So that's okay. why you need the Java installed. Okay. So okay. So Java and Maven to be installed on on my local machine. On your correct? local machine, yes. So okay. So yeah. Go ahead. And and then um, on the EC two instance, we also have to install the that same Java 
and Maven, correct? Or now, no? on the EC2 instance, you don't need to have Maven installed. What you need to have is Java, because mm -hmm. your EC2 instance is hosting the Nexus repository. Right. Right. Okay. That's what your that's what your EC2 instance is hosting. It's hosting your Nexus repository. So what you need to install is Java. Now, the reason I installed Maven is just to show people how you can install the Maven on your local host. Now, I already have the Maven installed on my local host. So if I want to install it again, it will just tell me the application already exists, right? So I just did that to show that in, if you want to install Maven, in case you don't have it on your local system, this is how you install it. Okay. Right? So that's what okay. I, uh, that's the intention for doing that. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. now our application has been installed, our application has been packaged and all of that. But then, uh, because of time, please, uh, we may not be able to, because if we want to do, our uh, time is fast spent, and I don't want the video to be too long so that people can um, you know, just follow as well. Correct. All right, so now let's quickly do something. I want us to Please do- Please correct me if I am wrong. Like uh, uh, the end product of Maven build is the thing which we are pushing into Nexus, right? Exactly, yeah, that's what okay. we're pushing into Nexus, yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, that's what we're pushing into Nexus. All right, now quickly because of time, I don't want us to, now let's just look at the second part. Because if you want to push to your Maven, if you want to push to, uh, if you want to push to the Maven repository, you are going to need uh, a few things. You're going to have to modify the pom.xml, right? You need some other Maven plugins to install. So here, if I, right here, uh, if you can see my screen, if I go here to, let's say, uh, Maven deploy plugin, Right, I actually need the Maven deploy uh, plugin in order for me to push into my Nexus repository. Uh, we are only seeing your browser. Yeah, let me see my browser. Yeah, the the uh the local host. The welcome to Java. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you see this now? Yes. Can you see my browser Maven deploy plugin? Is that visible? Yes. 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 It's visible it is. now. It's visible. All right. All right. Okay. Now, so. If you want to push to the Nexus repository, now you need this plugin, right? That means you need to modify um, your pom.xml file has to be modified, right? So if I click on here, I can actually get um, the plugin that I need from this place, but that would take a bit of time because you need to get the IP of your Maven. You need to enable some things on your Maven and all that, and our time is fast spent. So I just wanted to show us the Jenkins part so that we can also see how Jenkins can also automatically by itself build the application, you know, generate the Java file, package it, and then uh, send that into the Docker hub for us, right? So you can do disable, and then you can deploy an artifact with a customized POM, blah, blah, blah. So if I click on this one, it will show me a few things that I can use right here. So you can deploy artifact with some repository. So these are a few things that you can copy into your code to do your deployment. But of course, that would take a lot of modifications and our time is already fast spent. So let's just quickly go into the Jenkins part. Let's see how Jenkins can handle these things for us. Now, for most organizations, let me just mention this. For most of the organizations, quite a number of them will not be running Nexus, right, in their environment. Because if they are using um, AWS, for example, they're using AWS, for example, for their application, most likely they're going to be using an ECR repository in order to keep their Docker image and all those kind of things. So in a normal environment, most likely you're not you're likely to have a Nexus repository. But I just did that to show us that, okay, Nexus is also one of those things that is out there, it's open source, people are using it. You know, you just get an idea about it, right? But in an ideal environment, if they are running the application on AWS or on Azure, yeah, you know, organization, your organization is most likely going to use ECR, right? That's the standard. They're most likely going to use ECR. So you're going to push your Docker image into ECR because if you're running your Elastic Kubernetes service, your Kubernetes service is going to be pushing the, it's going to be getting this image or pulling the image from the ECR and not from Nexus, right? Because hosting another Nexus server is another overhead for the organization, right? And most organizations are trying to do away with, you know, server management, right? So why would... Every nation is using a different type. 
You said what? Docker or Nexus or something like that. Jen Jenkins. Okay. So most organizations are using, you know, they are using what you call the the ECR, right? Sure. So that's where they push the image. And then uh so for the ECR as so well. Is it that uh, ECR is exclusively for AWS, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, for AWS. Well, Nexus is open source. But Azure should be having its own kind of registration service, right? Like maybe is it yes, not? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. The, so each uh, cloud provider will be having their own uh, service, right? It Absolutely. is not that uh, everyone Absolutely. will be having ECR. So Azure Absolutely. will have its own. Google GCP will be having its own. Yes. So the organization is going to leverage that. So let's just just look at uh, finally. Let's look at Jenkins and let's see how you can use Jenkins to... Now, for Jenkins, uh, Jenkins deploys... It's a lot of plugins, right? You need to install several plugins uh, for Jenkins. So if you go to Manage Jenkins, for example, you'll see um, you know, plugins right here, all right? So these are ones... These ones are asking for updates and all of that. Uh, and then if you want to install any plugin, just go to Available, then you search for whatever plugin that you're looking for. So install plugins. So these are the plugins that I already have installed on my system. So there's the ECR plugin, there's the, you know, a lot of plugins um, that I have installed, right? So now, and that's, you know, all these plugins is why organizations are moving away, right? From Jenkins now, they're moving to GitLab CI CD, right? And then they're moving on to GitHub Actions as well, right? Because with Jenkins, you need to update with a lot of plugins and then anything can happen at any time with all of these plugins that you have installed, right? But with GitLab, you don't have to install all these plugins. Everything is just within the GitLab environment, right? So you can do everything within there. So if you go to global configuration tools on Jenkins, you can see some of the installations that I have here. So I have my Maven installed here as well, right? So if you look at it here, you have your Maven installed I have my Maven 3.91 installed and all that. So we're going to be calling this thing um, right here. Now, but before we do that, let's look at what we have in our GitLab repository. I've actually pushed the code into my GitLab account. So let's look at what we have in the GitLab that Jenkins is going to fetch because Jenkins is going to fetch um, from the GitLab repository, just like we saw in the architecture. Um, that we shared with us. <clears throat> Let me just look in here. Hopefully, I got that to work. Okay. Good. All right. So, this is just our Java Maven application. So, Jenkins is going to be fetching this application for us, and it's going to be um, running so these are Java application that we have right here. All right. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kunle. So for Azure, you have the Azure Container Registry, right? So in Amazon, you have the ECR, Elastic Container Registry. For Azure, you have the Azure Container um, Registry, so that you can publish your images into. All right. Thank you for that, sir. So Java Maven app uh, is right here. So our now, if you look at this. For each of these build applications, right? So for Maven, we saw that what we needed was a pom.xml, right? So but for our Jenkins, what you need is um, a Jenkins file, right? So it is inside of your Jenkins file that you're going to define what you want to run, uh, what you want Jenkins to build for you, right? So it's inside there. But your Jenkins also uses what you call is a groovy script, which is uh, a bit close, or let's say a simplified, a simplified version of Java, right? Uh, that's a groovy script. So all the things that we want to do has been defined inside the Groovy script. So if I click on my Groovy script to view it, I can see here that I have defined you know, everything right here inside my Groovy script. So these are the steps that I want to build. So I'm going to build a Java application. So my Maven is going to package the application just like we saw on the system, right? So, but in this, this time around, we're not building it, this thing on our system now. So we are building it using Jenkins, right? And that's the purpose of, you know, Jenkins. Basically, it takes care of all of those things by itself. So you don't have to worry your head about it. And then it deploys it to wherever you want it to deploy to. And then here, we have another step here. So we are building the image. And here, so we need to, we have some parameters passed in here. 
All right, this uh, Docker Hub repo is actually uh, the credentials that we created in Jenkins, all right? And then we are referencing that credential because what we want to do is after Maven has packaged the application, we want Jenkins to build that application, basically package the jar file, right? And build it into a Docker image. So once the Docker image has been built, then you can push the Docker image into our Docker Hub repository. Now you can push it into your ECR as well, but you need to define a few parameters uh, for your ECR, right? So, but of course, uh, in the course of the class, we're going to cover all of that. Okay, so what we're basically saying is that build um, the application right here. So these dots basically represents that the Docker file is in the current, you know, directory, right? So you can find the Docker file in the current directory. And then this is the, the details, the login details to a Docker um, account, right? And then push it to this Docker repository. So I'm going to open my Docker hub here. So you can also have your Docker hub as well, so you can have a Docker Hub. Also, you can have a you can have a Docker Hub, and then you can push images to that Docker Hub. Um, also, right. So that's just basically what this would do for us. So it will package the application with Maven, and then build the application. All right, take the artifact, build it out into a Docker image, and then push the same Docker image into um, an image registry. Right. So that's what that would do for us. And then lastly, let's look at the Docker file. So this is a Docker file. So basically we're saying that the base image for our Docker file is going to be this, right? And then we're exposing this spot. So we are saying, maybe in a package the application, the application and the package into the target folder. So what we are telling uh, maybe is that, okay, take the, you know, the, uh, the jar file, right? And then copy it into this directory in our Docker image. And then the working directory is going to be this, which is where our application is. So Docker, our uh, Docker image is going to be working uh, with this directory. And then the entry point is going to be this. So basically anytime we do Docker run, right? This is what is going to be executed, okay? So if you do Docker run, basically what you're saying is that execute this command, right? So that's what we're saying. So let's just quickly look at this. Uh, everything seems set. So if you look at our Jenkins file as well, we have referenced it. So we have our tools. So the tool we're using is Maven. Is been referenced. So if you look at here that I showed us the manage Jenkins. So if you go to global tool configuration, uh, Maven installation is right here. So uh, the name of our application is Maven, right? So that's what we are referencing right here. So the tool that we're using is Maven. So we need to reference it so that Jenkins will know that, okay, uh, we're trying to package an application with Maven. And then we're telling Jenkins here that the first stage is to initialize, right? So initialization means go and look for the script of Groovy that we have in our current directory. So Jenkins is gonna look up uh, the script of Groovy file that we have. So once the file is found, Jenkins is okay. And then it's going to build the steps for us. So step one is gonna be, you know, build a jar application. And so we are referencing Groovy, right? The GV here just means Groovy, then execute this build.jar, right? And then the next one also, Groovy, then execute this. Right, so if you go back to um, this place right here, the Groovy script, you will see that what we have here is, you know, what this is what we are executing. So all of these things are functions, right? This is a function, the build the jar function, and then we have another function uh, right here, right? This is another function that we have right here. So basically what we are doing in the Jenkins file, we are calling these functions, right? That's what we are doing basically in the Jenkins file. And it, this makes your Jenkins file a bit neater, right? Because if you have to put all of this in your Jenkins file, it makes it look um, ugly, kind of, if I can use that word, right? But with this one, you, you've, you've separated the whole thing. So everything is your script or Groovy file. And then within your Jenkins file, you can call out all of these functions, right? Which makes a lot of sense. So we have defined all the functions that we want to call out in our Groovy script. And then in Jenkins file, we are, we are only calling out the function. And that's why the first thing you need to do is to load the script. And then once you load the script, then you start calling out all of those functions. Please go ahead, Sam, if you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, so we, we can also use YAML language, right? Instead of the Groovy. Hmm. Can, can well, we also use YAML language? To, to... I'm not too sure. If you are dealing with um, GitLab CI CD, if you're dealing okay. with GitLab CI CD, then you use YAML. Let me just... Um, Okay. Sure. Uh, let me see. Do I have a YAML or something here? For GitLab CI CD, use YAML. And that's actually very clean, right? Let me just show us this. 
Yeah. Now, I actually built a, you know, this is actually a pipeline that I built uh, for uh, GitLab CI/CD, right? So for GitLab CI/CD, you use a YAML. Instead of Jenkins file, GitLab CI/CD uses YAML. And the YAML is really very clean, it's readable. Now, this is how it looks like, right? So compared to the Jenkins script. So for the YAML for GitLab CI/CD, these are the YAML uh, looks like, right? If you look at it, it's also the same thing that we're also doing, right, with the with the Jenkins. So but for GitLab CI/CD, this is what it looks like, and your pipeline looks something like this in GitLab CI/CD. Let me just show us that. So this is what the pipeline in GitLab CI/CD looks like, all right? Okay. Um, so if you look at it, so organizations are moving to GitLab CI/CD, and that's why in the next class that we're doing. It's one of the classes that we're going to be looking at. So this is just, you know, a build in GitLab CI/CD. So if I click on this, it will show you uh, the things that my application ran and all of that. So this is actually a Python application that I did. All right. So that's just by the way. So GitLab CI/CD uses the YAML file, but your Jenkins is the Groovy script, which is written. Uh, it's just like um, uh, maybe a simpler version of Java or JavaScript, right? So everything right here is set. Uh, so the first thing you need, the first thing you want to do in Jenkins is now you come here and then you click on clone. So you want to clone that repository, right? So you want to go to your Jenkins page here. You want to do new item. And then right here, you want to create a pipeline project, right? A pipeline project is what you want to create because in your project, you have different stages that you want to build, right? Uh, so first think of your name, let's just say Java pipeline. And let's just call this Java pipeline, right? So here I'll choose pipeline project, and then I'll click on OK to create my pipeline. And then it's going to ask me a few details right here. So I don't need to really put anything here, but of course you can put a description here if you want, uh, but some of these things uh, may not be necessary, right? So here is where we actually need to do is a few things. So here we're going to do pipeline script from SCM. So basically what that means is that we're pulling our pipeline script from the, what do you call it now? We're pulling our pipeline script from our source code management. So it's coming from my GitLab repository or the GitHub repository, whichever one you're using. So I'll choose that. So it's going to tell me which of the SCM. So I'm using Git. So Git can be GitLab, it can be GitHub, right? But of course they are all Git. So repository URL, I'll paste the one that I pasted here. So this is the URL for the repository. And then this repository is not public, right? So I need to provide a credential to log in into this repository. So already in Jenkins, I already created credentials for my GitLab. Let me just quickly show us that. So if you want to create a credential, let's go to, let's open a new tab. And right here, if I go to manage Jenkins, I can see where I have credentials right here. So under credentials, so you can see the amount of credentials that I have created already. So this is for my Docker Hub repository. And then I have my GitLab uh, credentials connected right here. And then my Netflow, Nexus repo also is here. So if I want to create my own credentials, what do I do? So you can click on system. Um, you click on this one, global credentials. And then from here, you have credentials. So but for most of the you know, connection to your Docker Hub, to your GitLab, is actually going to be a kind of username and password, right? Uh, if you are going to connect to an EC2. Now, another thing you can also do is you can take that image that Jenkins is going to deploy to the Docker Orb, right? You can take that image and then tell Jenkins to publish that image into an EC2 instance and launch the Docker runtime automatically. That's also possible. In that case, we are going to be using the SSH um, username. No, no. I'm sure I think that should be the secret test or secret file, right? Or you're going to be using, it can be the best credential. So it has to be the SSH username with private key. So with this one, then you, that means you have to put in your username for the key and then you, you type in your passphrase here, your private key here, or the PEM file or the PPK file that you downloaded on your AWS account. So if you enter it here, so you have to add and then you have to add your private key file in here. And so with that, Jenkins is able to deploy a Docker image onto your EC2 and then run the Docker image automatically. Now, in the next class, we're going to be looking at that in the next class, right? How we can take an image and then launch it directly on our EC2 instance with Jenkins. And then we're going to look at, because if you're deploying an image, that's just a single container. So we're, so in a case you have more than one container, so which means you want to run two containers, right? Which is where your Docker Compose comes in. 
So if you want to run two containers, that's where Docker Compose comes in, right? So we're going to be in the next, you know, free class, we're going to be looking at that, how you can run, you know, a single image on your EC2 instance directly from Jenkins, and then how you can also run two containers using Docker Compose, uh, right? Uh, uh, you know, on your EC2 instance with Jenkins as well. But for today, let's just stick with this. So username and password, you use that and you put your username, you put your password, you give it an ID and then you create it. So once you create it, you have all of these credentials that you have right here. Okay, so that's how you create credentials in Jenkins. So I have my credentials created already. So it's telling me it's failed to connect because I've not selected my credentials right here. Because like I said, this URL here, it's not a public Git repository, right? It's a private one. So if it's a private one, then you need to provide uh, the credentials to connect to, to it, right? So that's why it's telling me authentication field because it's not a public Git repository, right? So here I'm gonna provide my um, details for my credentials. So you can see that automatically that message disappeared because now I have provided the correct um, details. Now uh, here is asking me, so which of the branch, because you know, when, when it comes to Git, you have different branches. So the default one is the main branch and then you can have other branches as well. So if I go here, my own is main, it's not master. So I'm using main. So main and master is the same thing. It's just basically saying that's like the production branch, right? So when you see main or master, it's just telling you that that's the main production branch. So you can have other branches like for test, for dev and all of that, you can have that as well. All right, so where are we? Okay, so here I'll just edit this and then I'll say I'm using main, right? So my code is inside of the main branch. And then, yeah, it's telling me, so the Jenkins file is there, am I sure? Of course, my Jenkins file is right here in my repository, it's there in my repository. So everything is fine, everything is cool. Okay, so now I need to save. All right, so my pipeline is ready to build. Now, another thing that you can also do with pipelines is, you know, in a production environment, anytime you make a commit, right, to your Git repository, it can trigger a pipeline in Jenkins for you automatically. Right, that is also possible as well. But of course, uh, those ones are for maybe in the, in the course of the class, we look at all of that. So now the next thing we want to do here is to build this pipeline. So if I click on build now, so that will create a build job for me automatically. So let's see, the build job should come up shortly. So the build job is running. So if I click on this place, I can see what is going on behind the scene. If I click on console outputs, so let's see what's going on. So you can see now, what is going on here. So my Maven is building, it's uh, my, so you can see that Maven is packaging the application for me. All right, so the application has been packaged successfully. And then my, doc, my Docker <clears throat> login also was successful. And then it tells me that it's a success. So let's walk through all of these things together. So the first thing that it happened was that, you know, I started a build and then the first thing, you know, Jenkins would do is to look into my Git repository and connect them to see if it can actually get you know, the details that I have in that place. So if my Git connected successfully, right, it will download the, the, you know, the codes and everything for me. And then the next thing that I did was the you know, Maven package. So that was the command that I ran. So it ran the Maven package for me automatically. My Jenkins did that and it told me that the build was successful. And then the next thing that I did was to build a Docker image Right, so my Docker image also was successful. I was able to connect with my Docker login and all of that. And then the Docker image was, you know, everything was packaged successfully. And then after all of that, it was able to push, right, the image to my Docker hub repository. So we're going to be logging into my Docker hub shortly. And then we're going to verify whether that, you know, happened successfully or not. So you can see that the Docker repository, you know, it pushed it successfully there for me automatically. And so if I go back to my pipeline, I can see the build steps, right? That Jenkins took, right? So this is the first thing, the tool in a, the Maven tool was initialized. Then the initialization take place, the Java application was built. The image also was built and then was pushed into my Docker hub. So let's log in into my Docker hub here to verify if that actually happened. So that it doesn't look like, um, you know, are you sure it's actually published into your Docker Hub? So let's see that. So this is my Docker Hub right here. So and it tells me that, can you see? The last push was what? Two minutes ago, 
right? So if I click here, I should find my image here. So you can see that my Java Maven Hub 1.1 and it tells me that it was pushed here two minutes ago. So which means Jenkins actually packaged the application, all right, generated a Docker image from that application and then pushed the image to my Docker hub. And of course, it can push the image to your ECR too, if you want it to push it to ECR, that's also possible as well. And then if you want Jenkins to also log in into your EC2 instance and run the image for you automatically, that is also possible. So anybody that needs this application, you know, can come in here and then they can, if I click on it, they can come in here and they can download it and then they can run uh, the application. So if you look at it, this is all the things that happened, right? All the push, uh, all the packaging and all that that happened. So that's how, you know, Jenkins also works. So it makes it easier. So instead of running the Maven app on your system and all of that, you can just decide to do a pipeline in Jenkins and then it will run the whole process for you. And if you want to check your script as well to see the script that ran, if you click on the build, you can also do, I think uh, if I do replay, let me see. All right, so if you click on replay, that will show you the scripts that actually did the job for you. So this is the main script, which is your Jenkins file. And then it tells you the script one is right here. So you can also see the scripts that run the job for you. So here also you can do some copy and paste it somewhere else that you may need it from. All right, so that's the demo that we have for us today. So basically that's-, Bro, you know, that's Last uh, doubt, doubt, like in the main script and the uh, last script you have seen, is it like uh, the last one is for the stages we are defining and the main script is like what we are doing? No. No, if you look at this replay here, now the main script, your Jenkins file is the main script, right? Now yeah. the script, the script.groovy, which is this one, is just basically, uh, you don't want to add code. Let me use that word, anything in your Jenkins file, right? You don't want to put every of those things in your Jenkins file. So your Jenkins file is actually the main file because when we're creating the pipeline, it told us, do we have the Jenkins file in our repository? And then we said, yes. So what Jenkins is going to use is your Jenkins file. But that Jenkins file also has your script.groovy file, right? Which is what yeah. you can reference. Now, it's just like, if you're familiar with Terraform or some of these um, infrastructure as code too, you can actually, there's what you call parameters. In Cloud Formation, for example, there's what you call parameters, right? You can parameterize your application and then in your main resource section, you can begin to reference all of those parameters, right? Oh, in, terra, parameters. In, in Terraform, it's called um, variables, right? You can define terraform.tf as or variable.tf, where you define all the variables that you want to use. And then in your main.tf, I you now begin to reference all of those variables, that's right? Yeah, so that's it will the same the variables from the TF yeah. yeah, so that's the same thing that we have simply done with these as well. So the main script is the Jenkins file, but right, but then the Jenkins file is also referencing right, all the things that we have in our Groovy script, right? So that's just basically uh, what we've done, all right? So in the next, uh, the next, next week Thursday, the next demo, we're gonna be looking at um, packaging an application with Jenkins and then Jenkins running the application for us directly in our EC2. And then we can, we're also gonna look at um, Docker Compose, how you can start, you know, more than just one container. If you have like two containers you want to run, at the same time, how can you run it with Jenkins? And then how can Jenkins also start it up for you automatically on your EC2 instance, right? So that is what we're going to be looking at.